count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Okay, great. So last week we looked at verse or two weeks ago, two through four. This week is, is five through eight. Um, but would somebody just read that one more time for us, verses two all the way through verse eight. Yes, it's the same thing she just read. Again. All right. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. All right, great. I think that we don't uh, maybe listen as well as uh, first century people that were, I think, trained in listening a little bit better. And so um, I helpful, at least for me, to kind of get a good double take of the passage at the beginning here. So let's let's look, um, just a quick word from last time. The end of verse 4 talks about being perfect and complete. And um, I like to just look at that as where God wants to take us, right? That's the 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 sanctification process. That's the, the direction that he's taking us in our faith, being perfect, or we talked about being mature or fully grown up is that idea, and then complete is the idea of uh, wholeness. Okay, you're not, not lacking anything, like it says. So that's, this is what God wants for us. This is the direction that he's taking us, perfect and complete or mature and whole, and we saw, and what the verse says, is that in our broken world, one way that God gets us there is through trials. And it's trials bring perseverance or steadfastness, and when steadfastness is perfected, then it makes us perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So trials suck, but they are purposed to perfect us, and so for that reason, we can count them as joy. It's like, wow, that's like, ultimately that's leading me towards Christ-likeness, so that's that's what I want. I want to be like Jesus, who was the perfect person, the perfect human. And that's that's the direction that God wants to move me in. Yes, I want that. So trials, okay, if that's what it takes to get me there, um, I'll receive them with, with happiness and hope mixed joy. So here's the connection then uh, to, to starting in verse 5 for us tonight. If the end view, like Mark... Uh, who is this? James, like James said, is, is that we would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The very next verse, 5, says, if any of you lacks wisdom. So James kind of is like stringing ideas together here. And if you're not there yet, which we're not perfect and complete, we're lacking in something. And so that's what he's going to say. If, if you're lacking in, and we're going to talk specifically about wisdom here tonight. So if any of you lacks wisdom. Now, kind of what my hope is, and as we teach through James, remember, is to not just have this beautifully crafted sermon where you walk out of it and you're like, wow, this is something I've never seen. And he told me everything about my life that needs to change. But that I can help give an understanding of the passage in the context that it was meant to, that it was first spoken in, that we can correctly understand the words and the culture and the terminology and what might have been going through people's minds when they uh, were first hearing these things back in the day. So I want to consider this word, wisdom. 
I don't know about you all, but um, when I think about wisdom, uh, for whatever reason, what pops into my head is some guru uh, in orange sitting on the top of a snowy covered mountain, you know, with a little beard, and he's like a hundred years old, and like this is the wise, I've found the wise one, and he's out in the middle of, you know, I don't know where you'd find, but out in the middle of nowhere, and you're like, wisdom is wrapped up in an old man that just is like this super spiritual whatever, and that's where you find wisdom. That's just the vision that comes to my mind. And that person, that wise one, would understand life's deepest mysteries. And he, they'd have an answer for life's greatest questions. And like they're able to think deeply, and I mean, they just know, know, know the deep things of life and, and have an understanding of all of that. Um, for the Hebrew, or for the Jew, um, the wisdom that is talked about in, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures and um, the wisdom here in the New Testament, um, I'll, I'll give you kind of a general category and then some specifics. Wisdom in scripture is the idea, it, it's the way that God created the world. God created the world in wisdom. He sustains the world in wisdom. And wisdom is right by his side kind of personified in a lot of the um, Proverbs, right, of this, this creation tool that God uses when he's making everything. Um, I'll read from Proverbs 8 just to give you an idea of that. Wisdom, the way that God creates the world. Proverbs 8, 22, it says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work. Me, meaning like me, a personified wisdom. The first of his acts of old. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. Wisdom. Before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command when he marked out the foundation of the earth. Then I was beside him like a master workman. I was, his daily, I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. So wisdom somehow is existing uh, before and during and as a method of creation. And wisdom is the idea of everything functioning together in harmony. Okay, so for a human to be wise in the Hebrew mind would carry with it the idea of living according to God's created design. Okay, I'm living in line with that design. So, for example, God instructs Adam and Eve in the garden to rule of the earth and have dominion and be fruitful and multiply and enjoy all of this food and it would be wise for them to do all of those things. They could live according to wisdom just to just to follow God and how God set out the created world. Satan comes along and introduces a different wisdom, a false wisdom. And we read, Eve saw that, the, you know, the part of God's wisdom that he had given Adam and Eve was just eat whatever you want. Here, just don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So at some point, Satan comes along, tempts Eve. Eve saw that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was good for food. It was a delight to the eyes. And that the tree was to be desired to make one, yeah. what, wise. And she took of its fruit and ate it. Was that... God's wisdom, no, that was another type of wisdom that we'll read, I think, in chapter 3. It's demonic wisdom, or it's, it's, um, it's Satan's wisdom. So there's kind of two types of wisdom. There's wisdom from above, and there's wisdom from, uh, from the earth, earthly wisdom. So how do we live in, in God's wisdom? How do we kind of reacquire what God said out in the garden? It's just this idea of, of wisdom is, it's like this. It's like living along the grain of God's created intent.
or living, like going with the flow of how God has designed things to go. Not against it, okay? Wisdom God uses in creation, okay? It's God's created way is what is wise. Wisdom, uh, as the Bible seems to use the word, um, or words, is not explanation. Wisdom is not necessarily explanation. So I, I go to the wise guru in my mind, you know, one day if I have all these questions of life, and he gives explanation of life. That's not what, what wisdom is. Now, wisdom addresses life's deepest mysteries, but it doesn't just explain why life is as it is. Instead, what wisdom teaches us to do, it, it, it teaches us what to do in spite of those mysteries. So wisdom isn't an explanation of why, it is telling us what. I'm going to say that several times tonight. It's not why, but what. So if you read the, the biblical wisdom literature, specifically Ecclesiastes and, um, and Job, when you read those books, if you're like me, they are, if you're trying to figure out life's mysteries, those are incredibly unsatisfying books. They're called the wisdom literature, but what they do, even though they're, they're chock full of life's difficulties and mysteries and enigmas, but how do those books conclude? Is it answering all those questions? Not really. It's kind of saying, hey, so just trust God. You're not going to be able to understand all of these things. So trust God and do what he says and follow him and fear him. Walk in wisdom. Here's what to do. But it's not attempting to answer everything. If you think about the book of Job, it's two chapters of the most horrific trials you could ever think about or read about in somebody's life. And then it's 36 chapters or so of Job and his buddies like trying to figure out and make sense of you know, why and what's the explanation, why, why, why. And there's about, about four chapters of God telling Job, I'm not going to give you an explanation. And then we call that wisdom literature. That's wisdom. Not the explanation. It's not obtaining the why behind everything, but it's teaching us what to do. So that's um, the first uh, the first thing I want to point out. Wisdom is not explanation. Secondly, wisdom is not about information and obtaining information. It's about implementation. Okay, Wisdom doesn't sit in a book on a shelf. Wisdom is lived out in day-to-day -day life. It's not about obtaining enough knowing. It's about doing which fits well with the book of James, if you're familiar with it. Don't be hearers of the word, like don't just take everything in, but be doers of the word. It's not, wisdom isn't being knowledgeable, that's a different, that's a, that's a good thing too, but wisdom is experienced, it, it's done, it's completed in action. It's not being familiar with God's created ways, like cognitively, but it's being familiarized to them through practice, through your practice or other people's practice. So you're you become wise by, by doing. If you just take in the knowledge and you don't do, that's not wise. That's actually probably more foolish than if you didn't have the knowledge in the first place. So wisdom is doing. You're wise by doing. So we're not going to become wise by looking at the book of James on Wednesday nights and showing up here and reading this over and over again. We're going to be wise when we live out these instructions, and we're going to obtain wisdom as we live these things out. It's interesting, right at the beginning of the book, James is saying, he's talking about wisdom, and then this is a book that's not like some hard theological concepts that it's going to take years of existential thought and study to understand. It's very practical. Hey, live this way, do this, and meet the needs of the poor. It's, it's, this is wisdom, walking in the way that God has designed us to live along the grain of his created intent. A lot of us know uh, people who have a lot of knowledge, but are not wise at all. I don't know if you can think of people, but some man, they, they know a lot, 
but then you look at their life and it's not playing out in their lives. Uh, that's not a wise person. Maybe that's a knowledgeable person, uh, but that's not wisdom as, as Scripture speaks about it. Which is why, when we're, when we're talking about the book of James here, and in the future hopefully we'll have more discussion about, okay, so we understand this, God calls us to live this way of life, but how, how can we actually do this? Like, what should we do in our own lives? What should we do? Not why, but what? So, wisdom, okay? Not, not understanding why God created things this way or all the behind-the-scenes stuff, but how to live in harmony with that created intent or what to do to live according to it. Not why, but what? So, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, if you lack that, let him ask of God. We're not going to spend uh, time here tonight. One of the kind of minor themes of James is uh, recognizing that the good things that we have are from God. We have to seek good things from God, just like he's telling us to seek wisdom from God. You have to go outside of yourself to get wisdom. I don't know if, if um, y'all were here uh, a couple years ago. Josh Garaman, one of the Eternity Bible College professors, shared with us a couple weeks on the book of Proverbs. And one of the things that I remember that he was saying and pointing out as he was kind of summarizing some of the Proverbs was that one of the first things we need to know about wisdom is that we don't have it. And so he read this funny verse in Proverbs 4, 7. The beginning of wisdom is this, colon, get wisdom. You don't have it. You don't start with it, okay? That's the beginning of wisdom. Get it, and you'll be wise. And so we don't have it, and we're learning in the book of James and also in the Proverbs. God does. So Proverbs 4, uh, 2, 6 the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and from understanding. Okay, So that's just a, a small uh, uh, something that, again, we'll address much more later. Job's conclusion, or, or one of his conclusions in chapter 28 of Job, is that it's, it's where does wisdom come from? Where can I find wisdom? And he concludes, oh, it, it actually comes from God. And so wisdom is a gift from God. We're to ask for it. Ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. I spent quite a bit of time studying these words, generous, without reproach. Um, it, it means those things. Uh, and I, uh, I, I won't make it as flowery and beautiful as, as I think the original language is, but God has generous. He, he's generous with wisdom. He has, if you think about it, an infinite supplier. He has all wisdom because he created all things. And the idea of this generous word is that he is dead set or single-minded in wanting to deliver it to us. Like he doesn't have any other plate. He doesn't want to hold it back. He wants to generously give us wisdom without reproach. Reproach isn't a word that I use regularly. But it's just uh, when you are expressing like disappointment or disapproval of something. And it's saying that's not God. He's not bothered when you ask for wisdom. He's not like, oh, you're coming to me again for this. And um, okay, I'll, fine, I'll give you more wisdom. But don't try not to screw it up this time. It's, he's not demeaning us or insulting us. He wants, God wants to pour out wisdom on us. He wants to give that to us, okay? Um, we don't have to be embarrassed when we're asking for it. He knows that we don't have it, right? We have to get it from him, and so he's, he's ready for that, and he wants to give it to his children. He's generous, he's gracious, he loves to give it. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. Doubt, there's the last term I'll spend some time on. I, and I tell you this because it's nuanced a little bit different, differently in the New Testament than I kind of think of or might use that word. I, I think of uh, like I'm skeptical, right? Doubt. Um, 
two words to give you just to kind of round out the definition of, of how the New Testament uses this Greek word. I don't know what the Greek word is, but as we, whatever this word is that we read, doubt in verse six. No doubting. The one who doubts is like a wave in the sea. To doubt, that word means one to evaluate like positively or negatively, like there's nothing wrong with evaluating as a general rule, but, but that's how that word sometimes is translated. Or, and or to hesitate. So to evaluate. Uh, maybe you've heard the verse in Matthew 16, when it is evening, this is like the meteorologist Bible study, when it is evening you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red, right? And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. Um, I get the, those forecasts on my watch, you know, and 80% of the time it's opposite of what the forecast is lately, especially. It's, I was talking to Javon about my frustration. When is it, is it going to stop raining? And every day, yes, it's going to stop raining, and it keeps raining. Uh, but it stopped today, and I wasn't expecting it. And so so he said, God, or, or um, the the scripture here is saying, and in the morning it will be stormy today for the sky is threatening. And then Jesus says, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't interpret the signs of the times. The word interpret, that's the word that we read here in James, doubt. Okay, so he's saying, you know how to um, evaluate the signs in the sky and the clouds and the wind and whatever meteorologists do, or they did in the first century. Like, you know how to to read that, how to how to judge what's going on, how to evaluate that, um, but you don't know how to evaluate the signs of the times. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, in trying to determine whether what somebody says is from God or not, uh, Paul says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. That's the same word that we have doubt here, but it, you see it means... To, to examine some, or to evaluate or examine something or to judge something okay you're making you're kind of taking in all of the information and you're, you're making a, a judgment call okay that's the, the word that we have here for doubt you're interpreting you're looking critically into something you're dissecting something to make a determination or really simply put you're, you to, to figure something out okay? Again, oftentimes we use that kind of, that's a good thing, figure something out. Um, to evaluate or to hesitate, Romans 4.20 gives a good uh, description of this, that Abraham did not waver when he was trusting in the promise of God for his, um, that, that God would keep the promise about him having a, a nation of children, or I don't know how it says in Romans 4, but you, the idea, he, he, Abraham didn't waver, he didn't hesitate, like he expected that God was going to come through on his promise, and so he acted as if that was true, even in his sacrifice of Isaac, it was, God, he expected, he didn't waver, he didn't ask questions, he just kind of moved forward, and so to evaluate, to hesitate, so ask God for wisdom with faith and no doubting, so when you're asking for wisdom, don't evaluate, don't try to figure things out, and don't hesitate, like don't wait until you've gathered all of the proper information before you can actually act. And so you can see how even that doubting, so doubting and wisdom are kind of going hand in hand here, or, or, or they're being contrasted. Wisdom, I said, is not an explanation. So, so don't evaluate, don't doubt, don't use your own capacities just to try to figure things out and to look for the why behind everything. Wisdom is found in implementation, not just in your head, but in your actions. So, when you know what to do, don't hesitate, but act on it. Don't waver and think, well, should I don't know if I should do it. No, just, just do that. Don't hesitate. So don't evaluate, don't hesitate, but in faith, receive the wisdom that God is eager and wanting to give to you and move on it. So, so I, I think this sounds in a prayer. Uh, I was just thinking through what would that prayer sound like. I think that is, God, I, I lack wisdom. Would you... Show me your way, and I will commit to walking in what you show me, because I trust you. And I'm not going to evaluate and ask questions of, well, why would you ask me to do that? Why would you call me to do that? I'm, I'm going to do it, because I trust you, I trust your wisdom. So, 
in our context here, why do we think that James jumps to if you lack wisdom? Because like he had presented this picture of well, God wants to move us to perfection and, and completion uh, in him. Of, and it, but we're not perfect. We're lacking something. Why does he talk specifically, do you think, about if you lack wisdom? Like based on the context here of what we read earlier in, chapter, in verses 2 through 4. Like we could probably lack a lot of things in our in our faith, but he specifically says wisdom. Maybe because that's where we struggle the most to make the right choices. You know, okay. so we will sometimes we lack all the wisdom and we pray to God to help us to do the right thing. And especially in what what year. kind of times? Yeah. When we're experiencing trials. trials. Yeah. yeah. So when we're in those difficulties, I think like James is, is saying, hey, count it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds. Like that takes wisdom to walk in that, right? Of, of all times, a, a trial is a time that we're struggling to, um, to know what to do. But what tends to be our question, or what can often be our question, if you think about a major trial that you have, something hugely significant, very difficult in your life, Oftentimes what I do, what I've seen other people do, is we tend to ask the question, why? Why has this happened to me? Why, God, are you allowing this to happen to me, right? Well, wisdom, is wisdom meant to answer that question? Not as we've described it. Like, that is not the purpose of biblical wisdom, is to answer all of our why questions. James doesn't say, Hey, you're going to face trials, and by the way, if you lack answers, then ask God who's going to give you all those answers. He generously said, no, we're asking for, for wisdom, which is more of a how am I supposed to act through this trial? What am I supposed to do versus um, God just answer why this is happening to me? But our tendency is to think, well, well this, is, this can't be right. This doesn't feel right. Why is this happening? But wisdom isn't why, but what? So... I think James is suggesting when you face a trial, don't wonder why it's there, but ask how through this do I walk along the grain of your ways, God? And uh, so back at verse 6, let him ask in faith with no doubting, which is our knee-jerk kind of reaction to trials as we want to doubt. But ask with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. You think of somebody evaluating and hesitating, and like, okay, what about this? And oh, I haven't thought about this. And all the, well, why could God, God might be doing this because of this? And I, like all this evaluation that's just tossing a person back and forth. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. Double-minded, another thing we won't address at length here tonight, but uh, it's going to be a repeated thing throughout the book of James. Double-mindedness is the antithesis of verse 4's perfect and complete. Is it complete means to be whole, or undivided, not fractured. Uh, Double-minded means to be fractured, um, not whole. So in Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan names a character, Mr. Facing Both Ways. Okay, that's the double-minded man. He's unstable in all that he does. He's like, well, what about this, and what about this, and you're constantly, okay, Mr. Facing Both Ways. Um, when we're asking for wisdom, it's because we're lacking, and we, we want maturity and wholeness, or we ought to, and we're single-mindedly focused on that goal, and God is ready to give us wisdom because he's generous and gracious, and he wants that same goal for us as well. And God brings that maturity and wholeness through trials. So when we get the trials, let's not be double-minded and say, well, whoa, wait a second, why is, why is this happening? That's, that's doubt. Like, wait, wait, we're not trusting God. We're hesitating. We're trying to evaluate things on our own. But doubt kills that maturity process that God wants to take us on, okay? When, when we doubt the ways of God, 
which sometimes sounds like the question why. By the way, I think there's some why questions that are motivated out of a, a good place of our heart. But you understand the why, why God, um, like a child to a father, like well, why can't I stay out past midnight? It's like it's that type of um, questioning of God. When we doubt and we kind of look at the circumstances and we try to make logical evaluations and we hesitate and we, we avoid trials because that can't be right and or we, we weigh the, well, gosh, if it's going to take that to get through that, we're forfeiting our opportunity or the opportunity that God wants to use to move us towards wholeness and to completion. Okay, So James is telling us up front, he did in verses 2 through 4, our completeness, our wholeness, our maturity, our perfecting is going to come through ways that are counterintuitive, things that are not logically explainable, things that are unanswerable, that even the genius guru up on the hill can't answer. It's going to come through trials, and our doubts, our double-mindedness, just stunts that growth. It stunts us heading in that direction. So single-mindedness, almost, almost done here, single-mindedness, which is the, the title of our series in James, single-minded. It looks toward the end product, and it says, I don't have things figured out. But it asks God, how do you want me to get there? And I'm committing to act in faith, whatever trial may come along the way. Uh, one commentator said, it's putting all your eggs in one basket, and that basket is God. I'm ready to act, God, on whatever you tell me, even if it doesn't make sense to me. That's wisdom. That's trusting God. That's the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs tells us. I think of uh, blinders on a horse like the, that's pre preventing their peripheral view, right? So they can, because they're going to get freaked out if there's something else going on around them, and it keeps them focused ahead. Well, when we start to, like, evaluate and, and make these decisions, we start to hesitate, we start to evaluate, we get spooked like a horse, and instead of coming after Jesus, we... we we can tend to see what's going on in the peripheral, and we're Mr. Facing both ways, right? Like a horse's eyes, both sides of his head. God's wisdom is not explanation, but it's learning how he calls us to live, what he wants us to do, and then living in it and trusting him. So I'll just read a, a famous verse that I think describes this well in Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will, make your, your, he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. Now, turning from evil to me sounds like living along the grain of God's created intent. 